Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service of worship. Uh, this morning is Trinity, and this is the day when we try to understand that most difficult of subjects, the Holy Trinity. So I'm going to try and explain it to you all today. But uh, I hope that we are going to be blessed by Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we worship here today. And we're going to come into our greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus, and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And our sentence of beginning from Scripture. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And that's taken from Isaiah. Let's pray together as we start our service. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things, and by your will they have their being. You are worthy, O Lamb, for you were slain and by your love you ransomed us for God. From every tribe and language and nation, you have made us to be a kingdom and priests serving our God. To the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. And we're going to have our first hymn this morning. It's called Wind Upon the Waters. It was a beautiful song, wasn't it? Now, I promised you I was going to try and uh, illuminate us about the Holy Trinity. So I've got a little activity here, which incidentally is something you could do with children, uh, whether they're your grandchildren, nephews and nieces, or your own children. And it's to make 
a kind of Play-Doh. But th I, for this, I have three ingredients because we are, we are uh, illustrating the Holy Trinity. And for the purposes of this, this is flour. So this is going to stand for the Father, God the Father. So I put that into my bowl. Just ordinary flour. It's about two cups of flour there. And then I'm going to add salt, which stands for the Holy Spirit, half a cup, approximately. I actually was a bit short of salt this morning, but, um, but we'll pretend that's enough. That's for the preservative. And then the water, which for our purposes is going to illustrate Jesus. So we've got salt, flour, and water. Now we, this is the messy bit. So I'm going to mix this together, just a bit at a time. I hope I've got enough water. <laughs> We're about to see whether this fails or not. This is um, a lovely thing to do with children. The only, the only children I wouldn't do this with are very little children who um, still put things in their mouths a lot because there's a lot of salt in here uh, and you really don't want them to have that in their mouths. Oops, here we go. At home, of course, you could add a uh, food dye um, to um, make it a bit more interesting. But we're just going to use the three ingredients. And it makes a sort of pastry dough, really. And the salt will keep it um, nice and um, fresh for a couple of weeks if you put it in the fridge and in um, a covered container. So here we have it. We have our Play-Doh. Now this looks completely different, doesn't it, from the salt and the water and the flour. It's changed into something else altogether. But you can't deny that there's still water in here. There's still salt in here, and there's still flour in here. They haven't gone away. They haven't ceased to exist. That's a bit like God, you know? God has three elements, three powerful elements, but they are one. And that's how it works. I hope that maybe is a, an illustration you can uh, uh, use uh, for yourself and maybe to explain to your children. And if not, just have some fun with the Play-Doh. Now, this is the good bit, isn't it? I have to try and get this off my hands now. Oops. <laughs> oh, dear. Right. We just have a hiatus here while I get myself cleaned up, and then we'll have the collect. Oops. Okay, there we go. And the collect uh, today is Father, we praise you. Through your word and Holy Spirit, you created all things. You reveal your salvation in all the world. By sending to us Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, through your Holy Spirit, you give us a share in your life and your love. Fill us with the vision of your glory, that we may always serve and praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And we come to um, our readings. And our first reading today is taken from uh, the book of Romans. And it's Romans 8, verses 12 to 17. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, 
you will live because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're going to have uh, our second hymn now. You are God's work of art. this morning is taken from the uh, Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 to 17. So hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know, and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his world, a son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is the gospel of Christ. 
praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Let's um, come into a, a time of prayer before we examine God's holy word, shall we? Father God, we do come before you and we ask you, Lord, to be with us. That we may understand in our hearts, in our minds, you as God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, come into the world, come to save us, come to bring us into the kingdom. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. It's hard to believe that um, it's almost, well, almost 60 years, a bit less than that, when the first organ transplant happened. Uh, before that, um, anybody who was sick enough to need uh, a, a transplant, well, they just died. Uh, that's what happened. Uh, but Dr. Christian Barnard um, was the first man who dared to do it. And the first transplant he did, unfortunately, the patient didn't survive that long, only 18 days. The second, not so good either. But the third patient, who was a dentist, incidentally, survived for two years, which is nothing short of miraculous because there were no anti-rejection drugs of uh, any kind back then. So how on earth he managed to live for another two years, I don't know. And apparently, this is a bit macabre, but uh, uh, Dr. Barnard actually took uh, the dentist's old heart down to see him and said, look, <laughs> this is what it looks like. This is why it was in such bad shape. And, um, and he said, do you realize you're the first man in history of humankind to sit and look at his own dead heart? Now, I guess he could only do that because he was a dentist. And it wasn't too squeamish. I'm not sure I'd want to see mine. It's an amazing story, isn't it? But thankfully, if people are that sick now, there are amazing drugs to help people to live for much, much longer. It's become an everyday miracle, in effect, hasn't it? Because God works through people. But what's that got to do with our scripture this morning? Well, our scripture is actually all about new hearts and new beginnings. We're thankful for our physical doctors, aren't we? But we're even more thankful for our God who makes all of this possible. He can take a person who's been utterly destroyed by life, somebody who feels that they're so battle-scarred and weary and burdened, that they can't actually even see a future. And he can take them and he can heal them and, and renew not just their hearts, but give them a renewed mind and a new way of living, a renewed spirit. He takes away all of our negative and destructive emotions and replaces them with a heart that loves, and a spirit that's filled with love, joy, and wholeness. That is a miracle, ladies and gentlemen. And it does happen all the time. And we, we, well, we sometimes fail to recognize how wonderful this is when somebody's life is transformed out of all recognition. Now, we all start off in a place where we don't know God, whether that's a, as a little baby, <laughs> you know. Uh, we don't know God. And maybe we come to know God very quickly. That happens for some people, doesn't it? But for most of us, it's a gradual process that takes place over many years. And perhaps we have a few relapses along the way, you know. Perhaps we draw away from God, and then we come closer to God again, and so on and so on. That happens. It's just part of our uh, journey with Jesus, isn't it? But for Nicodemus, who, in our scripture, this changing of heart began one dark night as he snuck out to see Jesus because he wanted to have a chat with his teacher. Now, Nicodemus 
actually appears three times in uh, John's Gospel. And by the third time, Jesus' seed that he planted in him had really taken root and was growing and blossoming into a real strong faith. Nicodemus was already a man of faith in the Jewish tradition. He was a Pharisee, a man of influence, but he was quite frightened of what other people might say if he talked to Jesus. And that's why he was going in the dead of night to see him, because he didn't want any witnesses to criticize him. But by the time Jesus came to the cross, Nicodemus no longer cared what people thought about him. His heart had been changed forever, and he now knew that Jesus was the true Messiah, the hope of Israel, and the hope for the world both then and now. But how did this come about? How did it come about? As a Pharisee, Nicodemus belonged to the most prominent religious group in Israel. He was highly respected. These people, the, the Pharisees, were very well educated in Scripture. It doesn't sound like it from the discussion he was having with Jesus in our Scripture, does it? But he was. He observed all the laws of, of piety and cleanliness. And he must have been absolutely shocked when Jesus turned around and flatly contradicted him about what was important and told him that it was not enough for someone to be physically clean, because that's what the laws of cleanliness and uh, the observances concentrated on, wasn't it? Jesus told him that actually the most important thing is our whole nature, the way in which we act, the way in which we think, the way in which we speak and believe also needs to be cleansed or sanctified by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, even if you've been uh, brought up in church, done the whole Sunday school thing, you know, sung the songs, done the actions, whatever, and <laughs> been to church, it might not have been enough to bring you to a living faith. Things sort of sidetrack people, don't they? Perhaps something's happened in your life. Perhaps you've had disappointments. All kinds of things can turn us away from continuing on our journey of discovery in faith. And inconveniently for us, like people like me, <laughs> God has his own timetable. We'd love it if people could all sign at the door, I am fully up to date with understanding my faith. And uh, I'm on the right milestone now for, for, for coming closer to the kingdom. It doesn't work like that. God has his own sense of timing. And it's a perfect sense of timing for all of us. And that's, uh, you know, people just aren't made the way um, that cars are, for instance. You can't expect people to respond at certain times in certain ways. And I, I think myself, this is where we come unstuck a bit with confirmation even, you know? Uh, we plan rights of things like confirmation when children reach a certain age, regardless of where they've got to in their stage of faith. It's unwise, actually, to push a young person into confirmation if they are not ready to understand, if they are not ready to consciously give their life to Christ. It's better to wait for a few years and to patiently teach and sit alongside a young person and guide them and let them come later rather than push them when it, they're too young and then they think, well, I know it all now. Now I don't want to come to church anymore. How many times have you seen that happen? We don't want that to happen to our young people. We need to disciple them. And the same applies for older people too. 
I'm, I know full well people come to church when they're not fully convicted of who God is in their lives. That's okay. <laughs> I'm glad they're here. We're here to be teaching patiently and waiting for God's timing. Of course, if the Holy Spirit falls upon you, be you very young, you're much younger than we could, could, would consider for confirmation generally, or much, much older. When the Holy Spirit strikes, you're his. No two ways about it. You belong to God forever. Because I believe God has his hand on us from our moment of conception. He knows who he's calling. And it's just a matter of timing. And us listening to what God is saying to us. I mean, many of us who've been brought up in the faith probably never had a defining moment when we consciously knew and accepted Jesus as Savior. That's what it means about being born again. That's what the scripture was talking about, wasn't it? Perhaps you just grew into it, and it was a gradual process. I've heard that many times from people. But for others, it's different again, isn't it? Uh, perhaps they spent years doing the church thing, as we spoke about, without it really changing them in any real way. It's not that they're bad people or anything like that, but they take a bit of a pick-and-mix approach to their faith, perhaps using only the bits that they like. <laughs> I don't know. That's a temptation for all of us, isn't it? But God can work unexpectedly in all of us, and these people, these very same people who are a bit hit and miss about what they believe, suddenly get a firm push in the back. And they realize God is so very real for them. And it changes them almost overnight. And again, even the most unchurched and unlikely person can be smitten by the Holy Spirit. I've seen that happen many times. It's just a sudden change, a revelation that happens in someone's life. This should be actually quite reassuring for us as people. It's the Holy Spirit who converts, not us. We are agents of God, and yes, we should do the work that he sends for us to do, proclaiming the gospel in all the world, but finally, it is the Holy Spirit who converts us uh, to the faith. It's a very different journey for everyone. And probably only the minority are going to have a sort of Damascus Road experience of conversion. But whatever our path, our true life in Christ begins at that moment of realization that we are one of God's holy people. And things that would previously have held us back no longer have the power to do that anymore. We become a child of the living God, and we gr gradually become more Christ-like in our faith. Faith's quite simple, really, uh, when you think about it. We dress it up as being complicated, but it's not. You know, faith in Jesus means believing that he is God and believing that he saves us through his death and resurrection. It's realizing that we on our own merits cannot earn our own salvation, no matter how good we are. We'll never be good enough without Jesus. We are completely Jesus dependent and can only come to God the Father and accept eternal life through him. And God, the Holy Spirit, enables us to be guided in our lives here on earth and helps us towards that acceptance. And when Jesus says at the very end part of that scripture that all judgment has been committed to him, don't be afraid. It's not a final pass-fail quiz that you get at the end of life. It means that Jesus comes to save us, to bring us home. Whew, 
That's a bit of relief, isn't it? <laughs> Jesus is all about salvation for you and for me. And Nicodemus came to that understanding following Jesus' crucifixion. When uh, Joseph of Arimathea uh, came to claim Jesus' body and put him in the tomb that he'd prepared for his own death, Nicodemus was also there, and he provided the myrrh and aloes and spices and assisted in Christ's burial. Uh, These were really costly spices, you know. This is something you didn't just give away. There was over a hundred pounds worth of spices that he brought. They were meant for Nicodemus's own death. But it was the sort of amount that you would have for a king. And he gave it willingly to Jesus as he accepted him as king. Jesus, king of everything, of his life and all of humanity. Jesus is always here for you and for me, night and day. And in his perfect timing, which might not be our timing, in his perfect timing, he will answer our most confounding questions. He made the ultimate sacrifice so that you and I could have transformed lives and life eternal. And if we think we still need Jesus to be transforming part of our lives, because this is a process, this is a journey, we don't just go straight from zero to the end. If we need him to help us, then we ask. And when we ask for things like that, we will receive, believe me. Ask through prayer. Ask Jesus to start changing the thing you're concerned about in your life. And finally, Jesus will return one day to establish his kingdom here on earth. We'd better get to work preparing. Uh, We don't know when that day is going to be, do we? So we need to be ready for when he comes. But we know also we've been commissioned in that preparation to be the salt and light in this world. But perhaps this might be a bit scary for some people because it's quite a long list of stuff we're supposed to be doing, isn't it? We might uh, think it's rather overwhelming. It's um, because we're supposed to be uh, quick to forgive, patient, kind, gentle, faithful, and good, self-controlled, have a peace that passes all understanding, infectious desire and uh, 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 to bring joy and to share the good news of salvation. Help! You might be saying, I can't do all that. That's far too much for one person. I'm just an imperfect human being. And you'd be right. On your own, you simply, it's simply not possible to be all those things. But luckily, God has a secret weapon. The Holy Spirit, proceeding from the Father and the Son, with us always, strengthening you and me, guiding us and enabling us to be the best person that we can possibly be right here. And all you have to do is to call on the Holy Spirit to help you, and he will. Through him and in love of Jesus, our Savior and God the Father, we can share God's love in everything we do and everything we say until the day comes when we too enter into the kingdom. Amen. Let's bring to mind those things of this week which are burdening us, the mistakes we've made, the things we shouldn't have done or shouldn't have said, and maybe only realized afterwards. That's very human, isn't it? But which now are troubling us. Let's confess them to God and ask him to forgive us and enable us to be stronger and better and to be able to call upon the Holy Spirit to guide us 
in all strength. So dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. And God forgives us in these words. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Be forgiven always. Don't just pick those burdens up and carry them away with you. It's not just for Sunday you're forgiven, but forever. Let's pray and bring ourselves and the world towards God. Father God, we give you thanks for everything that we have, for all of our blessings, for all of the good things in our world, the good fortune that we have. Lord God, we thank you. And we pray for our beautiful world, Lord, the world which you gave for us to live in. We thank you that this is something that speaks to our spirits when we see the wonderful things around us, wild animals and, our, uh, and nature. And we say sorry for the times when we pollute or destroy. Help us, Lord, to look after your creation, we pray. Help us, Lord, to be guided by you, that we may care for this planet in the way that you desire. We pray for the nations of the world, Lord, for all that need you, for places where there is despair, for places where there is warfare, for places where families are fighting other members of their families. Lord God, into this we pray you bring peace. Peace and restoration, we pray for them. We pray for all leaders, Lord, around the world. This is a hard task. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless our leaders and guide them in all things godly. We pray you'd strengthen them for the task of caring for the nations. And we pray in particular for our leaders here in Canada at the provincial level, the local level, and the national level. And we ask you to help them make wise decisions for our future and for the opening up of uh, our society again as COVID begins to come under control. We know that this is a really hard thing to do. And it's so easy to criticize people. But they are only human. And we pray, Lord, that you would just help them to do the right thing at the right time. We pray for our community, Lord. And uh, we pray for all those people who need you, for those who are struggling with addiction, for those who are homeless, for those who have difficult family lives. Lord God, for each one we pray restoration. We pray for the church, and we pray for all leaders in churches, for bishops and archbishops and priests and ministers, pastors in all of our churches, 
as we help to lead the people of God. Lord God, help your leaders to be honest and true, just to treat, teach scriptural truth, and to be always listening to you and be guided by you. We pray for all of our congregations. Lord God, bless them and hold them true and fast. Help them to stay together, even during this time of COVID, where it is so hard. Help us to hold fast as the body of Christ. May we pray this blessing upon all congregations. And we pray for the sick, Lord. We pray for those who are sick in body, mind, or spirit, for those who feel lonely, for those who are feeling isolated. Lord, to all of them, we pray that you would bring comfort and healing wherever we most need it. Help us, Lord, to be your agents, to speak where we need to speak, to commit kind acts towards people who just need to know someone cares. Bless them, Lord. Bless all who need you. And we pray, dear Lord, for those who have been bereaved. We pray, Father God, that you would surround them with your love and compassion. That you would be so close to them that they would know, Lord, that they are not alone. That death has been defeated. That you will lead your people always into the kingdom. That we will be reunited with those we love and care for. Give courage for the day and comfort for the day, Lord, that we may move ahead and move towards reunion as we too come into the kingdom. Finally, we pray for ourselves, Lord. We pray, Father God, that your Holy Spirit would lead us that your Holy Spirit would infuse us. Your Holy Spirit, grant us peace. Give us discernment and wisdom to follow the path you have for us, to open our eyes, our hearts, our minds to where you are beckoning. So I pray for each of our congregation members. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come and fill us with power in you and lead us, Lord, where you, you would have us go and bless us for this week as we commit to your service. In Jesus' holy name, we pray these things. And now we gather our prayers and praises into one as we pray as our Savior taught us our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen and God's blessing for God's holy people in this coming week. May the Father, who fed his children with manna in the wilderness, strengthen you in your pilgrimage to the promised land. Amen. May the Son, who gave his flesh and blood for you, keep you in eternal life and raise you up on the last day. Amen. May the Spirit who leads you into all truth help you discern the Lord's body and empower you to proclaim him until he comes again. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and those you love 
now and forevermore. Amen. Now, if we come uh, to a time of notices, uh, the only notice I'm aware of is we're still looking for a rep for um, our youth camp, uh, Camp uh, Gichigumi. Um, so if you would be interested in that, uh, we would welcome you making contact with myself or with Diana in the office or with the wardens, uh, Sheila or um, with Janice. And uh, we'll set you on the right path. This is actually quite an important thing because although the camp is largely inactive at the moment, it is being used for rentals, it still needs someone who's capable of working with other uh, committee members to oversee the repairs that inevitably happen in buildings uh, to make sure things are ready for when we do have our young people coming back. And uh, also to be planning for when new camps uh, are to be uh, uh, held for our young people, hopefully next year. <laughs> I'm hoping that, um, that we will be opening up considerably by the end of the year and we can look forward to a joyful new year when we do m more of the things that we are used to doing. Apart from that, I think that um, nothing much more, uh, apart from to wish you a wonderful week. If you've had a birthday this week, happy birthday. If you've had an anniversary, happy anniversary and well done. And I just hope that you all have a wonderful week and I look forward to seeing you again next Sunday. Same place, same time. See you then. God bless you. And we're going to have our final hymn now. Ye watchers and ye holy ones. Thank you.